Okay guys, just a quick one before we get started. I had some difficulties with the audio and video quality, so there will be some glitches. Sorry for that, apparently the connection from Europe to Australia isn't that stable. Anyway, you will listen to three decades of strength and conditioning experience in Olympic sports and professional sports, so don't miss out on that. And let's, without further ado, jump into the interview. Today I'm joined by John Mitchell. <music> John has three decades of experience as a strength and conditioning coach, worked with Olympic sports, rowing, gymnastics, and rugby sevens, and professional sports, rugby union. John is also a board member of the ASCA, the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association. Welcome, John. Uh, thanks, Christian, for having me. John, how did you get into strength and conditioning? And I had a good friend who had a, a gym set up in his garage. So from about the time we were 14 or 15, we were, we were always sort of messing around with weights and, and trying out different exercises and all that sort of thing. Um, and I played, played a lot of sports myself as a, as a young, young man and then uh, yeah, I wanted to be able to improve my own performances. So messed around with that. I, I went through university and uh, became a PE teacher because uh, I thought that was the, uh, the best avenue to be able to you know, explore I suppose, the strength and conditioning base um, because strength and conditioning, I, I suppose, 30 years ago wasn't a uh, full-time professional um, employment. So um, I was lucky enough that at the time I was going through uni, there, there was a few um, guys just starting to forge their way in, in strength and conditioning around the world and um, that got me excited about moving from teaching into a full-time strength and conditioning role. And so for a number of years, nine years or so, I, I taught and I was doing strength and conditioning in the mornings and in the afternoons working with um, rugby league teams and then uh, managed to get a full-time position uh, working with the ACT Academy of Sport, working with uh, a lot of Olympic sports. And so that, that sort of started my, my full-time career in strength and conditioning. So yeah, that's that's where I, I started there and was manager of the um, ACT Academy of Sport, and then you know got to work with basketball and uh, rowing, cycling, archery, baseball, uh, you know a whole different range of sports. So it was um, yeah a really good good step in my career to start there. Yeah, cool. Well, what's your darkest moment as an SNC coach? Um. When you wrote this question, or I sent it through to me. I thought I haven't really had any dark moments as an S and C coach. Um, I've been really lucky in that um, I've had some great athletes to work with and coaches. Um, and then I thought probably my, my darkest moments. Uh, we haven't had much success. And you, you go back to your, your hotel room and you're away from your family and everyone else is feeling. You know, pretty bad about themselves, so no one wants to talk to you or anything like that. It's um, you sort of just left to your own thoughts and, and feelings, um, and you, you really want to ring up your family and, and talk to them, but it's you know, the time zones are all out of whack, so uh, it makes it difficult. You can be you know, in a room on your own and, and just having those thoughts about, you know, how could I've done stuff differently or better, or how could I've encouraged someone to. To, to be great on the day or was it part of the preparation I put in place that has uh, made this result for this weekend. So uh, you know, I think that the touring component and not being successful on tour is probably where I've had some of my darkest moments. But again, you know, the next day you, you get up and it's a new day and your athletes are there and they need you to put an arm around them or, or give them a, you know, a pat on the back to get them going again and then you know, everything is good again. So... Um, yeah, your dark days become some of your best days. So okay. that's that's mine. I haven't haven't had the the misfortune of being fired yet or anything like that. I, you know, I've been pretty happy in all the jobs I've had. So um, yeah, dark days haven't been that many. That's good. What was your best moment? Um, yeah, this uh, another uh, tough one. I've had a lot of really good moments. Um, I think one of my, my favourite ones was working with the um, uh, Paralympic cycling team 
and um, we had the one kilo time trialer, so it was a vision impaired cyclist who had competed in the 2000 Olympics as a as a high jumper, and he got talked into crossing over to track cycling um, to be on the back of a tandem bike. And the guy who was a pilot on the front of the bike was a young fellow I'd worked with who was a one k time trialist who um, was back in 2002. Uh, won the junior worlds, um, the one kilo time trial in the sprint, and the jump from juniors to seniors was quite quite a large jump, or still is in, in cycling. And the head coach decided to pair him with this uh, Paralympic high jumper because he had some spark in that. So we, we put together a plan um, for the 2004 Paralympics in, in Athens, and um, they had a number of different tournaments or events that they had to go to to start with and one of them was the world championships in Prague in 2003 and um, we, we sat in a bar and um, started talking about what we were going to do and I, I pulled out a, a beer coaster to write some notes on and we did our periodized plan for our, our six-month plan into this world championships in Prague on the back of a beer coaster and uh, I still have that beer coaster today um, is to, to remind me of the success and how they won a gold medal in Prague and then they, they won the gold medal in Athens um, in the kilo time trial. So that was, that was really exciting. But, but really any time when you, you put a plan together for your athletes and working with the coach and your athletes and the support staff and, and it, it comes to fruition, what you wanted to do works. So they win the game, they win a championship, they, they win a, a gold medal. Um, you know, they're, they're the great moments. That's why you, why you do your job. So um, getting that plan through and, and seeing the success is, is what I enjoy the most. Hmm. If you could travel back in time, 10, 20, maybe 30 years, what advice would you give a younger John? Um, I, I think a younger John um, needed to be more patient. Um, younger John wanted um, success a, a lot quicker and, And to that point, I, I suppose um, I'd, I'd say, you know, you don't get bored with the, the simple stuff. Um, you know, the simple stuff is often what gets the good results. So you, you don't have to come up with the, the best whiz-bang program in the world or you, you don't have to be trying to get up to the, the next level as quickly as you can. You know, be patient, um, learn as much as you can off, off the people around you and You know, be prepared to, to give a little to gain a lot. Um, it's not always about taking. It's, it's about, you know, helping other people out. So, you know, be patient um, and, and uh, you know, learn as much as you can from anyone you can would be my advice. <clears throat> Most often young S&C coaches are very ambitious or some of them are very ambitious. So it would be a balancing act between being ambitious and being patient, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, the ambitious ambition's good. Like you, you like to see interns or young S and Cs that are ambitious and want to want to strive to be better in what they do. Um, you know, the hardest thing is keeping the, the reins on those guys and ensuring that they they know the processes that they need to go through. So sometimes when they think they they know a fair bit of. Uh, information or think they know what they're doing and it's good to, to question them about what their process is and how they come to that decision that they're going to you know design the program that way or select an exercise or um, approach an athlete in, in a certain way so I think by continually questioning and, and reviewing you know what your, um, you know, your intern or, or assistant SNC coaches are doing will help them develop without making them feel that they're being slapped down every time they, they're trying to get their head above the cloud sort of thing. So, um, so it's about building that good relationship with the, with the younger S&C coaches as well. So keeping a, you know, a very open and honest relationship and, and giving opportunities to, to progress as well. What advice would you give young aspiring S&C coaches? Uh, I think, you know, it's always be open to learn. Um, and as I said, be prepared to give a little to gain a lot. There's not everyone's going to think what you want to do is the best thing since uh, sliced bread, so to speak. You know, 
um, you have to you have to be prepared to take on an athlete's ideas or, or a coach's ideas and, and be able to try and implement them and build trust and confidence um, with the athlete and the coach. And once you've built that trust and confidence, then you can start to say, hey, what about, what about this idea? What about if we do it this way? What if we try something else? Um, but if you go in all guns blazing to start with, uh, people get a little bit scared and, and think, you know, what, what's this you know, person trying to make me do? Or they don't know me. They don't know my coach. So I think just be prepared to sit back a little bit, learn from your, your athlete and from your coach as to what they want to achieve and where they want to go and then, then start to build in and, and thread your ideas into what they want to do as well. Um, yeah, that would be the best advice I could give a young S&C coach. You have hired assistant coaches or younger S&C, or S&C coaches. What were the qualities you were looking for? Knowledge and, and experience is always very handy. Um, but again, they have to be somebody that's a, a people person. Um, have a lot of very serious strength and conditioning coaches who, um, you know, have great knowledge and are very technically um, angled in the way they do things. But, you know, do they relate to, to the athlete? Do they relate to the coach? Can they get those athletes? athletes and coaches to buy into what they're doing can they inspire um, in the weight room out on the field or you know on the on the um you know the running track and i, I think that's that's part of what i look for in you know coaches do, do they have that that energy and passion to to be able to, to drive athletes how would you assess these qualities in an interview process oh it just comes down to you know, asking, asking questions about, you know, what excites them about coaching, um, you know, what, what makes them get out of bed to come in and coach um, athletes at six o'clock in the morning or at nine o'clock at night, um, you know, when athletes are having a bad day, what, you know, what makes them, make, makes them tick, makes them want to be there and, and teach these guys to be, to be better at, at their lifting or to be just better human beings. Um, so there's sort of questions I'll ask. I'll ask, you know, what 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 makes you different from other S and C coaches? Because you you interview a lot of S and C coaches, and they all come along. And they all know how to lift. They all have the knowledge. But what's going to be the little golden nugget that you have that's going to get you across the line? Um, is it a particular skill you have? Is it um, a certain set of knowledge that you've had been through a tough situation with that sport where you came out the other end or as an experience you had with a, a difficult coach and how you built that relationship with the coach to be able to um, come in and, and get a successful outcome even when, you know, it looked like it was, you know, there was going to be no outcome because you saw one way and the coach saw the other way. Um, so I look for, for little things like that. Um, you know, how, how can they add um, to our, our team of strength and conditioning coaches? You know, what, what are the are they going to add to our environment? Are they going to be able to inspire? Are they going to be a good support person? Um, do they have, have you know, a good uh, you know, technical base in databasing or um, you know, applications and things like that? You know, how, how can they help? What can they bring? And, and what passion do they have? If that answers your question. It does. It does. Thanks. <laughs> Let's go from young, aspiring SNC coaches to senior SNC coaches. In our industry, the strength and conditioning industry, you see people transition out after a couple of years from strength and conditioning to performance management or lecturing. And when I spoke to Dan Baker, he mentioned it happens around the 15-year mark. Considering you are in the industry for three decades, how do you stay motivated? Um, look, I think it's just the, the passion to be able to you know, get people to do incredible stuff. Um, and my, most athletes, when they go to your gym or if you're doing a conditioning session or whatever, they're, they're, not, they're not really champing at the bit to do it. So, you know, what method can you come up to, you know, create energy around a session um, to, to motivate that athlete, to inspire them to do great stuff um you know i like to to look at different quotes from different athletes or coaches or just from you know 
people in the community that have inspired other people and, and then use that as a basis for a session um, or, or come up with, you know, some stuff I'm working on at the moment is, you know, different, um, you know, animals in the environment and what they can do, like the, the dung beetle can lift, you know, 1,141 times its own body weight, um, which is incredible. And it's like a human being pulling along six double-decker buses. So, you know, if a, a small little dung beetle can do something like that, imagine what you can do as, a, as an athlete. We, you know, we want you to do this sort of stuff. Dung beetles, you know, basically pull shit along with shitty things all the time. So let's get in and get it done. Um, so I think it's... It's about getting that, that motivation and inspiration. Uh, and again, you, you know, you've got to create your own energy at times too because you, know, you can come in on the back of a loss and, you know, your athletes are feeling down and, they, you know, how do you, how do you get them up? Um, so, yeah, you've got to have different techniques and, and angles and that sort of thing to be able to, you know, again, once again, inspire them to, to get up off the floor and, and get in and, and, try and try and be better every day at what they do. You know, how do you encourage them to make their teammates better? Because great athletes make their teammates better. So how, how do we get them to do that? Um, I think that that's the, the continued evolution of, of a strength and conditioning coach. And, and once you lose that passion, or you, you, your, your passion may go somewhere else. Um, and, and that's life. That happens with everyone. They change in what they do. But um, for me, you know, I still in, enjoy getting up in front of a, a group of young men or women or, you know, older men, older women, and, uh, you know, trying to get them to be better. So, you know, I mean, that's what, that's what drives me. And, and sometimes, you know, it, it's hard. Um, you know, as I said, you come along and you've got a group of athletes who have had a bad run or, you know, they're, they're tight and cranky. Rowing's a classic one where, you know, they, they just get the pulp beat out of them on the water and then they send them into you in the gym after they've been on the water for four hours and you, you've got to try and do something with them. Um, so, you know, you, you've got to create that energy. And, and I can see sometimes that, you know, people, it just becomes hard for them to be able to come up with the energy to be able to inspire these people that have just, you know, been smacked around for the last four hours on the water or, or belted out on the, on the rugby pitch. So um, I think that that's why people move on and they, they, don't, they can't find that, you know, inspiration to keep, you know, trying to challenge athletes and make them better. Well, they find a new challenge too. People you know, might find it too easy and then decide, oh, well, maybe I can become an administrator and change things from the top and make life better and create more resources and that sort of thing too. So, um, yeah. I think there's a lot of different reasons why people move on, but for me, I, I just really enjoy what I do. So I think that's why I keep going. You have worked as an SNC coach as well as a head of SNC or SNC manager. How you would how would you describe yep. the different ways of working in these two roles? Um, look, I think uh, again it, it comes down to um, how organised you are with anything you do. Um, so if, you, if you're just working independently as a strength and conditioning coach or, or working with a, within a team, you, you need to make sure that you, you're organised and um, prepared well and, and planned well so that the people you're working with aren't um, negatively impacted by you doing the, the wrong thing or not being there on time or not having your equipment put away or... Or, you know, various different things like that. And I think as a, as a manager, that's a, that's a really important skill to instill in your, your group of, of coaches or your team of coaches that work with you is, is to make sure that they're organised and they're, they're well planned um, as well as, you know, creating that, that energy again as well as your athletes. And, and if you can show that energy and enthusiasm and, and provide opportunities for your staff to excel and, and give them tasks where, you know, they feel like they're, they're working in an area that they, they feel passionate about. Um, so, for example, at the moment, I, I have um, two staff who, you know, one, is, his main focus is on the conditioning side of things and, and he's got really excited about designing conditioning programs based off, um, you know, the 1.2K time trial stuff and we're looking at, GPS data and how we can relate the GPS data to 
the uh, you know, similar to like an MAS score, but we, we talk about peak game intensity running. And, and he's gone off and created these, you know, fantastic matrices of, of running programs and that that are specific to rugby union, which have you know, created a, a really you know, good conditioning base for our guys leading into this season. Um, and then the other guys we meet is he's a you know speed and rehab specialist and. You know, the, the stuff he's done around the speed, you know, we talk about a young group of, of players that um, are, are coming in and they're, they're relatively green in terms of their, their speed, technical skills and that sort of thing. So we said, well, you know, we need to go back to, to absolute basics with these guys. And it was a real good opportunity for him to say, well, you know, I've, I've worked at a, at a higher level with athletes and trying to come up with, you know, ways to inspire them, ways to keep them entertain whereas now he's gone back to well you know we're, we're a bare basic so let's let's see how the basics go and you know the basics have been really rewarding for him and he's got some good results from that so just giving your, your coaches the opportunity to express their energy and enthusiasm in the areas that they feel passionate about i think is a real key to being to being a manager yeah i was thinking about that when you spoke about inspiration and motivation i think you i mean motivation only go so far right if someone is not intrinsically motivated it's like um how do you say that flocking a de dead horse or something so yes, I think you yes, also yeah. need to i think you outlined it quite well that you kind of need to find where they are already motivated and then take it from this point forward i think um the, the motivation you can you can go in and give them all sorts of, you know, speeches and, and that sort of thing. And that'll work for, for some athletes. Um, but other athletes will be motivated by um, targets or something. So, for example, with, with rowing, it might be a, a certain amount of pays that they want to be able to do by the end of, the, of a certain block or they want to be able to do a certain time. Um, and then that time, depending on what it is, then you can break it down and say, well, to get that time, we've got to be – faster through this part of the course and to be faster through this part of the course you've got to be able to have um, a good strength endurance base through this part but to have that strength endurance because you're rowing so much you're going to lose lean muscle mass so we need to be able to put lean muscle mass on you so you can maintain you know, your strength and power qualities throughout the race so for you doing this this circuit type of training is going to help you um, maintain your lean muscle mass which will help you maintain your power so that in that middle part of the race where you start to drop off you actually surge through um, so I think going back and looking at the, the criteria of their their event or their sport and then bringing it back to you know those individual specifics as to what they need to be better at can give them some more motivation so just you know breaking down individual components or I might even be where you know, in, in rowing, another good example is, you know, when do they put the power on through the oar? Is it at the front end of the stroke or the back end of the stroke? So if they're not getting any power at the front end of the stroke, do we need to work on more rate of force development work? Or if they're not getting the power on at the, the back end of the stroke, you know, is it being able to sustain that max strength component? So... Again, looking at those different elements and, that, and then talking with your, your athlete then can motivate them to be better. So we say we work on a specific component so that you can be better, which will make you faster on the water or, or better on the rugby pitch or whatever it is. So, um, you know, finding those elements. And, and I think, you know, knowing that the, um, you know, the coach can give you a lot of information too. So when you're talking to your athlete and trying to motivate them, you say, well, you know, the coach thinks you're really good at this sort of stuff. And we can improve in this area. I really think I can help you improve by doing this, this, and this in the gym, or this, this, and this on the on the running pitch, or whatever it is. So, just coming up with with stuff that's related to the sport, or, or related to something that they want to be better at. So, you, know, you need to build that relationship with your athlete and with the. What's your coaching philosophy? <clears throat> My coaching philosophy, um, I, I think it's changed many times. Um, But I think, you know, I sound a bit like a broken record, but I, I think it's, you know, to create and inspire a positive training environment. And I really, within that environment, I want to promote a, a winning mindset. So, you know, our athletes are competing to be better all the time. So regardless of what, what the session is, there's always something that they're trying to win. So whether they're using, you know, velocity-based training in the gym or whether we're trying to get a, a new PR, uh, whether they're trying to, 
you know, complete an MAS set on seven seconds every time, whatever it is, creating creating a winning environment, creating a mindset where they want to be the best they can be every time um, is around my philosophy there. But then you know, that's that's a, a general philosophy, I, I guess, in terms of looking at all the, the, the areas that we work at within strength and conditioning. Um, you know, do you want me to go more specific into you know, lifting or running or, or whatever? But um, I think overall it's, you know, you know create and inspire that, that positive environment. What are your core values? That's my, my, my core values are that, um, you know, you, you, you always try your best, um, always prepared for, for the session you're going to go to. Um, like there, there's respect with, with yourself and, and, and the athletes you work with. And, um, and I think, you know, to, to have that, that resilience to be able to, to come up with a solution to to any any problem, um, and it's not always going to happen on the spot. And maybe you have to go away and research it and talk to other people. But um, yeah, you know, I think you know those are my my key values. You know, making sure you're organised, being being resilient, you know, being being energetic, you know, making sure you're, you're ready to go every time. Which person has influenced you most, and why? Um, I think, I think as a, an athlete myself or, you know, a rugby league player, um, my first S&C coach I had was Kelvin Giles. And um, Kelvin was the sort of guy that could um, get you to do anything. Like I, I always say that Kelvin could get you to crawl across broken glass. Um, he was just that um, charismatic figure in the gym that, you know, if you thought – You could do something. He told you you could do it, um, and he wouldn't let you wouldn't let you fail. He was he was always there, there pushing you as hard as you could, and uh, and a very positive influence on, on anything you tried to do. And I think you know, that first um, exposure to Kelvin and and over probably the, my first season of playing uh, rugby league under Kelvin uh, has sort of shaped. The sort of coach I wanted to be, and and be that person that, um, you know, when athletes walked in, they they were pumped, ready to do what whatever I asked them to do. So, um, it's probably the most influential from that point of view. Um, I mean, you know, three three of the other board members that I work with that um, I've known for a very long time. You know, David Boyle, uh, he, you know, he's very passionate about strength and conditioning, and I love his passion. Uh, you know, probably. 20 years ago, I, when I first met David, he's, he was always asking me about my training and what I did and, and that sort of thing. I thought, I've got, I've got to think more about my training as well and not just be, you know, focused solely on the athletes. So, you know, from that point, you know, I stopped trying to make excuses why I didn't train myself um, and then started to, to make sure I continued to train. Um, Dan Baker, again, just his enthusiasm is incredible and his love for S&C and his love of knowledge um, has really influenced me and, and makes me want to you know, continue to learn and, and um, be the best strength and conditioning coach I can be. And, and then finally, Julian Jones, who um, I was lucky enough, he, he took me through my level one and level two courses for the ACA many, many years ago. And... Um, You know, we've been colleagues, we've been on boards together, we've you know, worked on national programs together, we've been on the ACA board. And uh, you know, his understanding and um, political um, now is second to none. Um, you know, his understanding of how to get things done um, from an administrative point of view and not upset People and make sure you get the right result um, has really influenced me in my dealings with uh, administration and people like that because in my role that's you know, it's something you have to do as well as working with your athletes and coaches you've got to be able to try and squeeze that extra dollar out of the CEO to be able to get the stuff you need to be able to, to do you know the training that you want to get your athletes to do and you know by that 
you know, nice new bit of kit that is going to help you achieve what you want to achieve. Um, yeah, so that, those four people would be the, the main people that really influenced me. Yeah, two people I already had inter I have interviewed, so the other two are probably good recommendations to be interviewed. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <clears throat> um, when I did my research, I saw you have been heavily influenced in the mentorship model of the ASCA, the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association. Two questions. Yes. How did you guys identify the need for having a mentor? slash mentorship program and second question can you give a rough outline how that mentorship role mentorship program unfolds okay um well what we wanted to do was create in dan baker's uh words uh seeing, you know people who had um good knowledge of s and c were able to to pass on that knowledge to to our up and coming uh younger strength and conditioning coaches so um, we, we put in place a, a structure in a professional coaching accreditation scheme where we had our, our master level coaches um, underpinned by elite coaches, by professional coaches, and then by our associate level coaches. Um, so the associate level coach is the entry level into to the mentor program. Um, and an associate coach should be mentored by a professional coach and then a professional by an elite and an elite by, by a master level coach. Um, and our, our main idea around it is that then once those coaches have been working with a professional level coach, that professional level coach, if it's an associate working with a professional, the professional's already got other connections, so it builds a good network of of coaches within one person's mentor frame. And the way we work it is, depending on which level a coach applies for, they, they need to ensure that they have a mentor. Um, so they've approached someone to, to be a mentor and they're also mentoring somebody else. So it's a, it's a two-way street, so to speak, or it's top and bottomed. Um, we have a mentor agreement um, that our coaches must sign on to. And that, And in signing on to it, they, they put in place a plan as to, you know, how they're going to work in the mentor program. So um, if it was you and I, Christian, I'd sit down with you and I'd say, all right, well, um, what I'd like to do is to be able to meet with you um, on a regular basis. And you, you might say to me, oh, John, I'm a very busy man. Can we, can we meet once a month? I'd say, yeah, once a month would be great. Can we do it on phone or by Skype or can we meet in person? And you, you go, oh, look, how about we do it on phone for, you know, two sessions, so for two months, and then we might do a session where we meet face-to-face -face and do it that way. Um, so, again, you know, just trying to make sure that, the you know, whoever the, the mentee is isn't, you know, taking up too much time with the mentor as well. So they agree to a plan. Um, and then they agree to the different things that the, the mentee wants to um, achieve from the mentor program. So if, um, you know, it might be if I was working with you and I wanted you to be my mentor, it might be, well, you know, Christian, can you teach me how to, you know, make really cool podcasts and find really cool people from all around the world um, to be able to come and do the podcast with you? Um, and that, that might be part of our agreement. The next one might be, you know, how, how do you, How do you deal with, um, you know, the, the Dutch athletes and, and their environment and how do you, you deal with travel or, or something like that? So, again, you come up with some different questions and that so that the mentor knows exactly what's going to be asked so that they can be prepared as well when the, the mentee um, makes contact with them and, and wants to have a chat about, um, you know, different facets of, of strength and conditioning. Um, And we've found it to be a really good good program that um, you know, the coaches coming through are gaining a lot of benefit from it. And I think the, the networking component of it becomes really powerful when you, know, you may ask me a question and I'm not sure what the answer is, but I can say, oh, look, Dan Baker knows about that stuff. How about I ask Dan and you know, I'll, I'll get an answer back to you from Dan or how about I'll put you and Dan in contact with each other and then... You know, again, that grows that relationship. So, so it's all about building up those networks and growing relationships. And then that strength comes when, you know, somebody's been mentored for you know, a period of time and they apply for a job. 
and they can say, I've been mentored by you know, Dan Baker or by David Boyle or Julian Jones, someone like that. And then straight away, someone sees that and goes, oh, wow, this, you know, this person's come through you know, some good breeding. Um, you know, we can you know, definitely look at them for, a, for an interview or potentially for a position. So you know, it has quite a lot of power in that way. Out of personal interest, <clears throat> you mentioned, for example, Kevin Giles, he could get people to do anything he wanted them to do. Yes. So there, in our industry, there's always this unquantifiable coaching ability that it's very difficult to, well, it's very difficult to put on a CV. It's very difficult to articulate. It's something that you have to be able to do. Is that something you have addressed in your mentorship program as well? Um, not specifically, no. I, I think it's um, uh, it's something that comes up in, in conversation. I think, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I, you know, the coaches I look for, it's, you know, can they inspire people to be better? So, again, if you're, if you're working through that, that mentor agreement with someone and they're a bit dull and don't speak properly and do this sort of thing, well, you, know, you start to talk to them about, well, you know, how can you change the tone inflection of your voice so you can create that energy around what you're doing to be able to get your athletes to, to do what they want to do. So again, it comes down to what the, you know, what your mentee is trying to achieve through the mentor program, but also as, as a mentor, you know, you can give advice, but you know, you, you have to be careful about how you give the advice because, you know, you can turn someone off very quickly if you're, Start saying, well, mate, you, you're pretty boring. You don't give much energy. And if I was one of your athletes, I don't think I'd even come to the gym. So you, know, you, you just got to be careful about how you, you, know, you get things across to, to your mentees or, or even, you know, when you, you're talking with your mentor, you know, you, you have to be respectful of, of their you know, feelings and that sort of thing as well. So, yeah, but it, it's, it's a really good program. It works well. In a team of coaches and support staff, everyone is wearing his or her own head. If there's conflict between the different support staff, how do you deal with that? Well, I think it comes down to like your overall um, goals of the program you're working within. So um, you look at what, what's, the, what's the final result that you, you, know, you ultimately want to achieve And then how does how does your role fit into what you're going to do? So again, if you're you know, you're working with strength and conditioning coaches, with physios, with, with doctors, you know, nutritionists, um, sports psychologists, coaches, assistant coaches, specialist coaches, all that sort of thing, it comes back down to well, ultimately, you know, we're, we're trying to you know win a championship, we're trying to achieve a time, we're trying to do whatever it is. So let's let's go backwards through the process of what we're trying to achieve or what was the plan we put in place. The plan was to do A, B and C, um, but for some reason we can't do B. Why can't we do B? Is it because of a, is it an athletic uh, limitation? Is it a limitation of the support staff? Um, how, do we, how do we find a solution to that problem? So I think going back and looking at what the, what the process, what the plan is and what we're trying to achieve, um, you can generally get a result that way. But again, you know, different people will have a different way of getting from A to Z. Um, you know, it might be through the alphabet, it might be around and cutting bits out. So again, it's, a, it's about going back to what, what was the agreed plan that we had. This is a plan we agreed to. Um, you know, why haven't we continued with the plan? Is it a, is it a problem with, with someone going off, off track? Is it a problem with the athlete not following the plan? Um, you know, what, what's the problem? And then, you know, bringing it back to something that's objective and not making it about, you know, individuals not doing the right thing. So what we wanted to achieve is this. At the moment, we're not achieving it. Let's, let's get back to the plan and, and try and get through the, the, the problem, the, the situation or whatever it is by reassessing what we said we wanted to do and then how can we improve it to get to where we want to get to. When we, as SNC coaches, when we're dealing with individuals, athletes, um, we often have some high-profile individuals who have their own ideas, expectations. Um, if an individual expectation or idea is very different from your 
idea what needs to be done. How do you approach that situation? Uh, well, the, it's, it's a difficult one because you, you know, you're dealing with individuals who um, you know, are very strong-minded and, and very driven in what they want to do. Um, I've had my best experiences working with those people where I've um, you know, really listened to exactly what they want to do and, and why they want to do it and, and how that's going to benefit them. And then by incorporating that into to what I want to do, it, it gives them um, more ownership of, of the program. Because um, it's very easy to say, I went up, you know, I'm a strength and conditioning coach. I've been doing it for 30 years. I know stuff. You should listen to me. You know, I know what I'm doing, but you, know, you don't know the athlete. You don't know how they think. So I think you know, a good example is um, when I first came back to working with rowing, um, I was working with the, the current uh, well, not the current, she, she'd come second in the single skulls and, um, you know, she'd been rowing for eight years at, at a high level and leading into the Rio Games. Um, she had some pretty strong ideas of exactly what she thought was going to be the way that she would be able to train to, to get to where she wanted to go. Um, and I had my own ideas as well as to what, what I thought would work. So, it, you know, over, over a course of you know, a few weeks and months, um, I was able to, you know, through gaining confidence in her and, and by using her ideas, was able to thread in my own ideas as well. So I think, you know, I talked about earlier, you know, giving a little to gain a lot. And I think that works really well with, with athletes, uh, you know, your senior athletes and, and, and athletes who have a, a strong opinion on exactly what they need to do. You know, you, you need to help them out if, if you know, if they want to do biceps at curls as part of their program and you don't really think they're important, well, you know, they think they're important. So, you know, stick some bicep curls in their program and they'll go, oh, wow, he listened to me. He, you know, he really listened. I, you know, I trust him and, and that sort of thing. Um, and you can stick in your other, you know, three or four exercises that you think are important, but because they want to do bicep curls, you know, there's no harm in throwing that in there. Is it going to help them be better? Probably not. Is it going to make them feel good about themselves? Yeah, it might. Is it going to give them trust in you? Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, be prepared to, to you know, put in some things that you, you don't necessarily agree with. But, you know, the athlete, if they want to do them, you know, that'll give them that confidence in you and then you'll be able to, to get a lot more later on because they have that trust and, and confidence in you. Yeah. How does a typical training day in the life of an SNC coach look like? Um, I'm not, not sure there are typical days. Um, for me, it's, uh, you know, it usually starts, starts pretty early. I, I like to get up and walk my dogs with my wife. We, we go out and have a walk and we talk about our days and, uh, you, you sort of get your head in the, in the right shape for the day. And, um, I don't know, I'll come home and, and maybe have some breakfast and then, uh, And generally, my, my kids are still asleep at this stage, so um, I'll, be, I'll be heading off to, to work. I'll arrive at work and you know, look at my computer and uh, make sure there's any emails there that may or may not need to be answered or whatever, and then generally go into, um, in the role I'm in now, into a coaches meeting where we'll look at uh, the planning of the, the, the final planning for the, the rugby session that's going to happen for the day. Um, then from there, that'll generally flow into a, a team meeting where the coaches will, um, you know, talk about different strategies or tactics or whatever with, with the players and, um, you know, show footage of games and things like that. Um, then that'll will generally transition into, um, you know, the, the preparation for, um, you know, the field session. So there'll be guys down with the physios having, you know, ankles taped and shoulders strapped and, That sort of thing. So during that time, I'm generally walking around, talking with the athletes. You know, I've looked at their wellness data that they put in earlier in the day, and, and start saying, "Hey, you put down your hamstrings are seven out of ten today. They're four out of ten yesterday. You know, what's going on there? You know, why are you feeling a bit tight?" And they'll say, "Oh, I feel a bit tight from whatever," or they'll say, "Oh no, I, you know, that was a mistake. Fat fingers. So I, I didn't put in the right data." Um, so you just start to build up, you know, that rapport again with your athletes. So, you know, they might say they're not 
feeling great that day. So it's a real opportunity to get around and, and touch base with, with all your, your athletes and, um, you know, discuss with them how they're feeling um, because you can put all that, that data into, you know, uh, you know, whatever spreadsheet or whatever it is, but until you actually talk to the person, you don't have the context around exactly you know, why they've put those points in. Um, then I'm generally dealing with my, my other um, S&C stuff about what's going to happen while the rugby session's on. So there'll be guys that are injured that will need uh, rehab work or off feet conditioning um, will be mic'd up. So I'll be you know, talking with the sports scientist who's um, you know, looking at the GPS data while the session's going. So I'll be looking at you know, who's not meeting their running metrics during the session and then discussing you know, exactly what we need to get topped up, whether we pull someone out of a certain drill or put them back in. Um, that sort of thing. And, you know, generally at the back end of the session, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have top-ups for guys that, that need specific topping up. There may be guys that are, have to have return to contact, so we'll, we'll go through different return to contact elements where they're taking tackles or making tackles. Um, the coaches will be giving us feedback on, on different players at different times throughout the session. So making notes, I have a little black book that I, I keep with me all the time um, while I'm on the field or in the gym to make notes. Um, on the back end of the, the session, we'll uh, generally review it with the coaches as to how successful it was. Um, while this is happening, one of my assistants will be um, preparing the recovery centre to make sure that the guys are going through the recovery, um, you know, getting the nutrition and hydration sorted out, um, getting any um, sort of hydrotherapy or hot cold stuff they need to get done um, that'll flow into lunch and lunch will we'll have a review of, of how the morning went and um, it'll be you know, checking you know, the numerous emails you get while you're out on, on the field and making sure you're answering whatever has to be done there and then preparing for uh, the gym session um, in the afternoon and with a, uh, a big squad in rugby, we generally have to run them through in, in two groups. So we'll split them into forwards and backs. And so we'll have to prepare the gym for, you know, the forward session around, you know, if we're doing any velocity-based training stuff, um, if we're using timing gates, sprint gates, that sort of thing. If we're starting out on the on the field and doing more of a, a locomotion, um, hip mobility circuit or something like that before they come in to do their, their main lift. Just make sure that's all prepared, ready to go. Um, as I was saying before, I like to have little presentations for the players when they, when they come in and just around exactly what, what's expected of them in the session, you know, whether I put a little quote there or whether it's you know, giving some fun fact or whatever it is, making sure that's all, all good to go. Um, and then, then throughout the session, um, you know, I'll have assistant coaches and interns that all you know, have specific roles and tasks that they need to perform. Um, and then I'll, I'll work with you know, certain players, different groups around coaching um, within those sessions. Um, and again, they, they may have recovery on the back of that. They may have massage or, or something similar on the back of that session. And we'll have two groups go through. So uh, maybe over a you know, two-and-a-half-hour period, those two, two groups will come through. Um, and in the back end of those sessions, I like to, you know, have a wrap up and, and just talk about, you know, what we tried to achieve during that session and whether successful. If anyone did something great, you know, you, you know, point them out and say, you know, you did a really good job, or you know, who got PRs in that session, and what, whatever it may be. Um, and then again, bring the, the group group together the, the coaches that so were working in the gym and just do a quick wrap up and a review of how the session went, how we can be better, um, you know, what, what it needs to be. Um, you know, by this time it's usually, you know, four or five in the afternoon and um, I'll look at what other work I've got to do and then I'll try and squeeze in a, a session of my own and uh, make sure I keep my body ticking over so that, that I'm fit and healthy and then, uh, Get home to the family, and if I'm lucky when I get home, my, my lovely wife has uh, got some dinner prepared for me, or she's there waiting for me to get home and cook it. So, um, yeah, that can be can be interesting, and you know, spend a bit of time with the family, and then again, probably knock over another hour of, of work, admin, programming, scheduling, that sort of thing, and um, 
and try and get to bed. So it's uh, uh, not not every day, but that, that's a fairly standard sort of day as to how to work. Sometimes you know, we'll have weights in the morning and rugby in the afternoon, or we may have a recovery pool session or a stretch mobility session or something like that throughout the day. But um, it's it pretty much starts early and finishes late. So yeah, that's that's my day. You have worked in Olympic sports and in professional sports. How you would you describe the differences in the day-to-day -day working between the two? Um, look, I think um, you know both sports um, are very similar, or, or, or both environments are very similar, and then they can be very different. Uh, um, you know, it can depend on. Yeah, you know, the the culture of the sport. Um, so, for example, something like gymnastics. Um, you know, it's it's very traditional and very driven in in what they do. Um, and you know, when I first sat down with the coaches with gymnastics, I said, "So, um, you know, what what does a a typical session look like?" And they said, "Well, you know, is our typical session here? We come in, we do our warm up." We go into to this apparatus, we'll do this, we do this, we do this. And I say, okay, well, so what do you do, you know, in the afternoon? Oh, we do what we did in the morning. I said, so what do you do tomorrow? And they go, well, what we did today. Okay, well, what do you do in three weeks' time? Uh, what we did today. Let's say we're six months down the track, what do you do? Well, we, we do what we did today. So, so sometimes they get... You know, the sports can be like it's full-time professional Olympic sport, but it, it's quite backwards in the way that, that it operates. Um, and then other other you know components. So, for example, when I was talking about the cycling, you know, that's you know, they they don't have much funding at all here in Australia, and you know the Paralympic cycling even less. But you know, these guys were were working full-time, um, coming in and training around their their working commitments, but you know they're working full-time in office jobs or studying and that sort of thing and then coming in and training like professional athletes. Um, and then you can get professional athletes that that's all they do is their sport, but they train like they're amateur athletes. So I, I think it depends on, on the culture of the sport and, and the, the culture that the, the coach and the, the staff that are working with the sport bring to the sport as to, you know, how they operate. It's... Um, Yeah, it can be it can be very different, but but very similar, and uh, yeah, it just depends on the groups and uh, you know the individuals within groups as well. You know, it can take one one uh, you know rotten apple in the barrel to to spoil the lot as well. So you know, identifying that athlete or, or coach or whatever it is, and then you know trying to um, you know change the way they think or their mindset within the group um, to create a better outcome. Uh, I guess that, that becomes very challenging and, and you see that in, in both environments, whether it's a Olympic sport or a professional sport. You, know, you always get um, someone who's, who's going to cause a little bit of cancer there. But fortunately, at the moment, the group of guys I'm with are, are, are an excellent group and uh, we don't have any of those issues at all. So, yeah, that's great. How do you design a trading program step by step? Uh I'll go back to what the you know the goals uh, um, of the season are, and 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 going back and doing a needs analysis based on you know, what you know do do we need to be stronger? Do we need to be faster? Is it more about um, being more uh, aerobically conditioned? Um, what what's going to make us better for the competition that that we're going to be involved in? Um, so then I look at you know what the, what the structure of the the season looks like. So if we're you know we're trying to go to an Olympics, it might be a, a four year cycle. The the plan that you're looking at, um, if it's you know, uh, professional sports like you know where I'm at the moment, it becomes a, a season by season um, prospect. So you, you need to to look at well you know, what what do we what do we need to achieve. Um, To beat these other teams, what do we need to do to achieve a time? What, what, what do we need to do? So, go back, do that needs analysis. Is, is it more about uh, leg power and drive 
than you know lower body strength or upper body strength. Um, you know, what what are those key elements we need to find? Um, and then look at you know how's how is that structure going to work across uh, a season? So whether you're going to, you know, you know what periodization plan are you going to put in place? Um, if you're working in um, a, uh, a competitive sport that's a, a week by week prospect, you can't really put in place a a, um, a linear model of periodization because you know if you're trying to get all the, the the power component at the back end of the season or all the phosphate components at the back end of the season, then you've missed big opportunities. Whereas if you're working, you know, to a single um, competition point, so if it's a world championship and you know you're going to make the world championship, then you can you can you know work to a linear periodization model. Um, within you know the the sports environments where you're playing week to week, you have to use more of a I like to use a sports conjugate model. So whereby you look at you know the different components of each of the um, uh, qualities that you're working with, and then break that up across the week. So for example, with um, energy systems conditioning, I look at well you know we need to have um, you know, aerobic, our, our, our um, alactic and lactic components. So where do we fit those into the week within a speed environment? We need to have our acceleration, max velocity and change direction elements. So how do we squeeze them into our week? And then within our strength, you know, when do we still need to work on our hypertrophy or, or injury prevention, um, prehab type activities, as well as our, our strength and power and our uh, reactive um power and our uh, elastic strength and, and those sort of components. So how do we fit all those into a week or how do we fit them all into a, uh, a micro or meso cycle? So again, going back and, and looking at those, those elements and where they fit in is is crucial in, in terms of your planning. So for me, then the, the next step is, well, you know, what, what time have we got during a week? So, you know, you might... We, in a, a rugby program, it could be that you get three exposures in season to, to your strength and, and power elements. So within those three exposures, how much time do you have? Do you have you know, 60 minutes, 45 minutes? You know, what, what's your time frame? The exercises that you need to put in place to be able to execute the skills that you want to execute to become you know, better when it comes to the pointy end of the season. So... Um, again, I think it's a, there's a lot of you know processing you need to go through. But again, you know, look at you know the bigger picture and then start to work your way down from you know the the full season down into the different parts of the season you want to want to break up into, then into your, your weekly schedule. Then it's going to be into what your daily schedule looks like, and then splitting it up into how your your program is going to look on the day. Um, so you know, what's your preparation going to be for your running session. So what drills are you going to do around the running that you're going to go into? Um, is it going to be around, you know, your, your hip mobility? Is it going to be about foot intrinsics? Is it going to be about um, calf endurance? You know, what elements there do you need to do prior to the session to ensure that you can execute the session correctly? Um, you know, how do you, how do you split up your, the, the timings you go from, you know, long to short or are you going from short to long or are you doing a mixed methods? component within your running, within your gym session, you're, you're splitting up your week, you're doing it, you know, a lower or an upper body split and then a whole body power, for example, or are you going to do a push-pull method or are you going to do an anterior chain, posterior chain component? Um, so, again, it really comes down to what, what, you, what your emphasis is and that around how you, you put your program together. Then um, you know, if you're looking at a gym-based scenario, well, you know, timing... You can come up with lots of elaborate exercises and that sort of thing, but at the end of the day, you know, the coaches aren't going to give you a lot of time to get stuff done. So what's what's going to give you your biggest bang for your buck? What are your, what are your big rock exercises you're going to do? Um, so for me, you know, the, yeah, yeah, your core core lifts are, are super important. So you know, can they get their Olympic lifts done? Can can they squat? Can they do single leg derivatives of squats? Um, can they, you know, push, pull, hinge? Um, you know, are they doing you know, your posterior chain work and that within your session? Um, 
So they're, they're the big things that, that I think we need to tick off. Um, all of my will, will have a, a warm-up component in them, which, you know, depending on what the session is, it may be more a, a, a running emphasis, it may be a, a more of a core emphasis. Um, or, you know, big front rowers within rugby, we have, a, you know, like a scrum core complex that they do where they're, you know, specifically in the position that they would be in a scrum and then we give them challenges around you know, how they they move their core within that environment. Um, and then, as I said, throughout the session, we'll, we'll superset stuff where they'll be doing a, one of the major core lifts, but then we may have an accessory or an armour exercise that we superset with it to make sure that you know, we're, we're keeping on top of any little minor things. So you know, we might pair a squat with a, um, a lateral band walk so that we, we're you know, activating through our hips and getting those things working there. And then, um, you know, the back end of the session, we always have something where we, we're doing an activity together. So it may be a, a core activity, it may be, a, may be an arms, it may be a, a guns and shoulders or something there where we, you know, we're always starting a session together, doing our warm up, and we're always finishing a session together so that, you know, people aren't just wandering off and you know, willy nilly doing their own thing. We would try and keep everyone together. And, at the end of the session so that they're, they're doing something there. Um, and how's that? Does that answer your question? Or it does. Got more up to- no, no, yeah. no, it does. It's good. Thanks. Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Uh, yeah, there's some, some good power. I mean, uh, the guys that I talked about before, you know, Julian Jones or David Ball, Dan, well, no, you've interviewed Dan. You probably interviewed Kelvin as well. Um, but, you know, someone from another country who, um, who I worked with was a, a guy called Craig Twentyman. So Craig Twentyman worked with um, within rugby with myself and he, he worked with the Australian women's rugby sevens team that won the gold medal at Rio. And um, he worked with the men's rugby sevens program. He's just moved to New Zealand and working with the uh, Auckland Warriors rugby league program over there now. So... Um, I think he'd have some good insights. He, he comes from a track and field background as well, so he's, he's got some in, interesting stuff uh, around his speed and, and power development stuff that um, I think is really valuable. So yeah, he'd be worthwhile having a chat to. Oh, cool. Where can people find you? Um, the easiest way is probably on Twitter. So I'm at jamitchell0133. So you can get hold of me on there, or uh, yeah, email wise, um, just on uh, ja mitchell zero one three at outlook com. Cool, John. Despite all the technical difficulties we had, thanks for sticking yes. to it. Thanks for your time. No, thank you, Christian. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right. All the best. <laughs> Thank you.